If you're looking for the best and brightest display, if you want the most powerful processor and the fastest charging on any smartphone, those things are not on the Pixel 7 Pro. And even before I got my hands on the pre-release version of this phone, just by watching the Pixel 7 event, it was super obvious that Google is taking a very different approach than some other companies. Their main focus is on software improvement rather than hardware ones. I also ran into a camera bug, which was kind of frustrating, but overall, the real questions I had were, did Google do enough? And is this phone a good value at $899? From a design standpoint, it's really similar to the Pixel 6 Pro. We're still getting that same visor look, but it's now aluminum rather than glass. Now, personally, I like this look better because the visor seamlessly flows into the frame, but I did get a pretty serious gash in mine before I got a case. And this is more proof to those of you who always ask me why I have to put a case on all of my phones. Well, this is why, and I'm simply not qualified to have a phone without a case. And to those of you who can go without a case, you're my heroes, and you'll be happy to know that you're getting an even more scratch resistant back. Now, another thing that I really like about this visor approach from Google is that the phone is really stable when it's on my desk. It doesn't wobble like most other phones and the display is slightly tilted forward. And speaking of the display, it doesn't seem to extend as far into the curve this year. And some people are gonna like that in terms of aesthetics and other people like me are really gonna appreciate it because the cases can be even more protective. Now it's a quad HD plus display, which looks good, but when you get it, it's only set to 1080p. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but I immediately switched mine to 1440 and it looks great. I I also activated smooth display, which automatically adjusts the refresh rate to as low as 10 or as high as 120 hertz. And it does that in order to provide smoother animation and scrolling when I need it, and then improved battery life when I don't. And we'll be back to battery life later on, but if you want the best battery performance, keep this feature disabled. It's also a pretty bright display at 1500 nits, so it's not quite the 1750 nits that we get on the S22 Ultra or the 2000 nits that we get on the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max, but it's definitely bright enough to use outside in direct sunlight. Now, one of the things that the Pixel is best known for is photography. And when we look at the camera system, we're going to start seeing a lot of software features being highlighted but that doesn't mean that we didn't get any hardware upgrades. So while we're still getting a 50 megapixel main camera with the same aperture and angle of view, the 48 megapixel telephoto lens is now a 5X optical zoom versus a 4X on the Pixel 6 Pro. So we're able to zoom in and get tighter shots without sacrificing quality. The ultra wide camera is 12 megapixels and it now has a wider angle of view than the previous models. So it can capture more of the scene and it's better when you're shooting larger groups or when you're working in a tighter space. It also now has autofocus so it can be used for macro shots with macro zoom. What's super interesting is seeing how much computational photography goes into every shot that you take. So when you preview your shot for the first time, you'll see that it takes about a half a second for the pixel to do the processing, which is probably something that you've seen on other phones, but this might be the most drastic improvement that I've seen so far. The image becomes sharper, it has more detail in the shadows and the highlights, and the noise removal is super impressive. So what you actually get at the end is so much better than what you see on the screen. There's also some real time processing happening. So when I took a few shots of this Rubik's Cube, you can see that as I move the camera around, there's a ton of noise in the photo. Now, once I settle down, a lot of the noise is removed. And then when we look at the final photo, it's an even better result. When we go outside and we give this sensor even more light to work with, you can see that the photos are absolutely beautiful. Again, we're seeing the software do a fair amount of the heavy lifting. And in terms of photography, I would put the Pixel 7 Pro on par with essentially any flagship phone on the market, especially for a user who just wants to point and click. And the Pixel 7 Pro handles zooming with a combination of hardware and software. So for example, when you go from 1X to 2X, 
It actually captures a 12 megapixel photo from the center of the 50 megapixel sensor. Instead of taking that 12.5 megapixel bin photo from the 1x zoom and then cropping into it. And that ends up giving us much better results. Now, once you go above 2x zoom, then the phone uses the main lens plus information from the 5x telephoto lens to improve the details in the center of the image. Now, as we keep going, there's super res zoom, which Google says combines software, hardware, and machine learning to get up to 30 times zoom. Now, I wouldn't use the 30 time if quality is super important to you, but another cool feature is the zoom stabilization that you get once you go beyond 15 times zoom. Now, that feature stays engaged all the way up to 30x, and it helps you keep the shot as stable as possible. Now, the selfie camera was also improved. It's slightly wider than the previous version, and it does a pretty good job in terms of sharpness, skin tones, and dynamic range. Now, ultimately, I would still give the edge to the iPhone 14 Pro Max and the S22 Ultra, but keep in mind that both of those phones are more expensive. Night shots are another known strength of the Pixel, and we can see that the 7 Pro really does a great job here. It's able to take night shots faster, so there's less motion blur, and being able to get these types of shots on a phone is a real plus. The one super annoying bug that I ended up running into had to do with taking a photo previewing it, and then trying to return to the camera app. So the phone would go back to the app, but it wouldn't show me what the camera is seeing. And it didn't matter if I switched lenses, the only way to get around it would be to switch modes, so like maybe to video and then back to camera. I was really hoping that I wouldn't have to wait for a patch, and luckily a reboot took care of the whole thing, so hopefully it was just a one-off. Now, video hasn't really been a strength of Pixel phones in the past, and this year, Google took another good step forward. We're getting 10-bit HDR video at up to 4K30, and if you disable HDR, you can also shoot at 4K60. Now, overall, I would say that the video quality on the Pixel has definitely improved. I still think that the iPhone has better autofocus for video, and it can blur the background in 4K versus only 1080p on the Pixel, but it's great to see that Google continues to close the gap. Now, what's responsible for all these great camera features is the new Tensor G2 chip. Now, I don't want to rehash the Pixel 6 Pro long-term performance, but the new version feels much faster and much more responsive. So if you look at benchmarks, which I always feel like only tell you a part of the story, you'll see that the Tensor G2 is ahead of the G1, but it's behind some of the other recent chips on the market for both single and multi-core performance. But the question should be, does this actually matter for the vast majority of the things that you do every day? And the answer is, well, what do you do every day? Google definitely focused on improving machine learning, computational photography, AI, and battery life, rather than trying to achieve the absolute best performance in benchmarks. Now, the GPU also runs smoother, and I was able to play all of the typical games that I play, so things like PUBG, Genshin, Asphalt, all of them without a problem. And like my other non-gaming phones, the Pixel 7 Pro did heat up if I pushed the graphics settings all the way up and I played for a long period of time. So it looks like Google is doubling down on optimizing the chip and the software for what they think will be important for the non-super techie user. So things like better camera performance and improved voice assistant experience and other software features like the recorder app, which I severely underrated. This app is so good at transcribing what I say that now when I research a video, I just dictate my thoughts instead of typing them into a Google Doc. And that way I have everything already typed up and it's a lot less work to go back and organize my thoughts. And speaking of organizing, I love that you don't get a whole bunch of bloatware with the Pixel 7 Pro and you can just add the apps and games that you want without having to clear out a whole bunch of junk. Now overall, the software experience has been very smooth. And that's super important if, as a company, you're going to put so much emphasis on the software. The phone is extremely responsive, and even when I've had two apps open in split screen, I didn't notice any lag. And this is where developing your own chip, again, helps Google optimize performance for the software features that they think are important. You're also getting great features like call screening, magic eraser, which helps you remove unwanted elements from your photo, and photo unblur, which can take a blurry photo and improve it using some sort of wizardry. Now, Google is also 
offering three years of major OS updates, which is nice, but it doesn't quite put it on par with Samsung or Apple. For biometric authentication, we have two options. So first, there's an optical under display fingerprint sensor. And my experience with it has been pretty good overall, but I still prefer the one on my S22 Ultra. We also have face unlock with the front facing camera. I've heard some people say that it hasn't worked great for them, but in my experience, it worked really well when there's plenty of light and even in fairly dark environments. Now, obviously there's no IR, so it's not gonna work in extremely dark situations like my iPhone, but it did work in darker situations than I expected it to. Now, as far as battery life, I've been super happy with the 5,000 milliamp hour battery, at least so far. I'm finishing days with somewhere between 20 and 30% battery life and that's with 1440p resolution with smooth display enabled and with the always on display and the pixel 7 pro also has a battery share feature so you can wirelessly charge your headphones or even another smartphone if you want to help one of your friends out now of course if i sit down and i play a bunch of games for a few hours that's going to really eat into the battery life and i would definitely need to charge it but wired charging is limited to 23 watts so it's not as fast as a lot of the phones on the market and google says you get a 50% charge in 30 minutes, which I found to be relatively accurate. So with Google doubling down on software features, did they do enough with the Pixel 7 Pro and is it a good value at $899? Now keep in mind that you can also get a Pixel 7 with many of the same features for $599 and that's something that a lot of people should just jump at. Now, ultimately, if you're looking for possibly the smartest smartphone on the market and you're not someone who needs to buy the most impressive specs, the Pixel 7 Pro gives you a very good experience at a price that's lower than its competitors. Now you should see how the iPhone 14 Pro Max compares with the Samsung Z Fold 4. Click on my face to subscribe. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.